Hi, and welcome to module three of lecture eight. So in the previous module, we discussed empirical distributions, empirical frequency distributions, relative frequency distributions, marginal distributions, and so on, all to give a sense of how real variables, real random variables are distributed. Now we're gonna take a step back and try to understand the theoretical processes that lead to particular realized sample distributions. And the key thing we're going to talk about now is known as the probability mass function, or PMF for short. The PMF is very closely related to what we do in the next um, lecture, the probability distribution function, or PDF for short. The major difference is the PMF represents a discrete random variable, i.e. one that only takes a discrete set of variable of values whereas the PDF represents a distribution, a continuous distribution, where the random variable can take on a continuum of values. In this, in this lecture, again, we're gonna to stick to discrete random variables. We're gonna talk about the probability mass function. The probability mass function actually is a relatively straightforward concept. We've already seen it when we talked about histograms. The probability mass function just specifies the probability that your random variable equals some particular value y, say indexed by i. We can shorthand that and say it's the probability that you observe yi. That's all it is. It tells you the probability of observing every value in your discrete, um, in the discrete support for your random variable. Now, there's a couple of important properties. One, is that each probability must be between zero and one. You can't have a chance of observing some value be less than zero, nor can you have it be less than greater than one. A zero means there's never any possible chance of observing that value, and a one means you are guaranteed to observe that value. You can't get more than that or less than that. Or you can't get more than one or less than zero. Second, it must be the case that if you add all these probabilities, all these values together that are in your distribution, you must get one. You must draw something. You can't draw from the distribution and get nothing. You have to draw one of the values in the support of a distribution. That's really it. That defines a probability mass function. You've seen examples of this when we, when we looked at, um, at, at histograms. So the histogram, the height of each bar, told you the relative chance of drawing that thing. The histograms, I kind of sketched out were, were empirical histograms from, from, from sample data, but you could also do the same thing theoretically. Now, in going forward, we're going to see some examples of distributions. I can really draw a straight line on this tablet sometimes, so I'm not going to try to draw distributions out well. I'm just going to show you a picture from the book. So, here is one. This over here is a binomial distribution. If you can see that over my face, you can definitely see it. Um, it has mostly later parameters, but the important part is e the height of each of these bars over here is the, f the relative, the probability of drawing that particular value. In this case, there are 100 draws, and we'll talk about that more uh, in the next module, in the you know, two modules from now. Um, but as you go towards the middle here, you get higher and higher probabilities of drawing that particular value out of the 100 draws. So this is one possible probability, probability mass function. There are others, and we'll talk about them again in a couple modules. The important point, though, is that you can represent, um, you can represent this graphically as well, and these are the probability of drawing each individual value from some, um, from the distribution. Now, why do we care about this kind of thing? Well, it turns out that a lot of the situations we deal with in the social sciences are represented pretty well by an existing theoretical probability mass function. We'll talk about a couple of classes of, of these in this lecture. One class um, relates to trials. Say you have a particular trial in which you can either get yes or no, right? Some experiment, you can get yes or no, A or B. Well, if you repeat that, you sketch out a distribution, the binomial distribution, assuming certain things about the probabilities of drawing the trial, drawing each of the A and B, yes or no, or whatever. Right, there's certain assumptions we'll talk about more when we talk about binomial distributions later in this in this lecture. But the upshot is experimental trials 
often behave in such a manner as to be appropriate as to approximate a binomial distribution, which is the one I just showed you the picture of. So if we understand what's called the data generating process behind our data, right? What's the underlying process, the underlying mechanism that leads to our data, we can associate that process with a particular distribution for discrete variables there would be probability mass functions. And a lot of the time, they already exist. These distributions that are appropriate approximate, approximators of our data generating process, of, of our underlying mechanism that we have in our, in our situation we care about, are already figured out for us. And we can use them along with appropriate statistical tests to see whether or not um, our theories related to these process are supported or not. So that's, that, that's, that's a major reason why we do these things, is that we create these theories, these stochastic theories, that tell us that increasing one thing leads to an increase or decrease in this other thing. That is consequent, we also, as part of these theories, propose some mechanism for how this is happening. These mechanisms um, lead to particular expected probability distributions, and we can compare our sample distributions that we obtain when we do these experiments or when you look at observational data or whatever um, to the theoretical expectations for our underlying process and then we can test our theories in that manner. All the practical parts of this will be done in your stats classes. Again, this is not a stats class as I keep saying, um, as I keep saying for this part of the course. But this is the motivation for why we're going to go through and learn some probability mass functions because they're going to be relevant to our work. The second kind we're going to talk about later are event count distributions that model a process in which an event can happen or not and the number builds up over time right for instance wars right as you go each year there's some chance that countries will go to war over time the number of wars will build up based on these underlying chances that will create a count of events military um, disputes or act or, or civil wars or whatever you want to specify right um, you could do less unpleasant <laughs> examples. You could talk about how many bills pass in a Congress and some chance each bill passes in each, in each period. And that can vary based on underlying, underlying theoretical ideas, like, for instance, polarization in Congress. Right? All sorts of things you can look at. There's, for all of them, there's an underlying process you're positing, and this process gets translated into a probability mass function, a theoretical probability mass function that should be representing your data, if your data is being generated by the process you posit, you can compare that to your actual um, practical, you can compare that to your actual practical um, sample that you actually look at, it would be an experiment, experimental sample, or observational sample, and then see whether or not your theory seems to bear out in the real world. Okay. So this is um, the basics behind the probability mass function. Note this is incredibly general. So we're going to simplify it slightly by, not simplify, we're going to complicate it actually slightly, but make it a little less general by adding the concept of parameters. Now, what we talked about so far does not involve parameters. It's a very general concept, the chance of being in any particular, of getting any particular realization of the random variable. In practice, though, we're going to try to fit parameters, often we're going to try to fit parameters of these distributions. What's a parameter? A parameter is some um, constant effectively, although we treat as variable sometimes, it's some element that re that has some bearing on the way in which the particular distribution looks. It affects the, the way in which the probabilities are assigned to particular values. So for instance, going back to this example we saw here, find the page again, this particular distribution I just totally flip past. This particular distribution was formed by um, a, a binomial distribution, which we'll talk about later, that has the probability of drawing any particular yes or no equal to one half. And you can see that distribution gives a peak at 50, meaning if the chance of drawing yes or no is a half individually, and you draw 100 of these, you should expect, in theory, to have the highest chance of all the possible draws be the middle, 50. You've seen this before when, you're rolling, when we talked about the example of rolling dice. If you have two dice, the biggest, the probability is highest of rolling a seven. Um, 
when the sum of the, for the sum of the two dice, and that relates to the individual chances of rolling each of the two individual die separately. Right? So the chance of rolling one through six is uniform for the first die and the second die. Together, the joint probability um, traces out a distribution for the sum in which the peak is going to be at seven, falling off around there. Right? If we were to change the underlying process, we would change the distribution. If, for instance, the chance of rolling each individual number and die were not fair, so you had a 100% chance of rolling a 1 and a 0% chance of rolling anything else, so it was a really unpleasant die, right? You would always roll a 2, right? So the distribution would not look like a peak at 7. It would, in fact, look like a peak at 2 and 0 everywhere else. Similarly, if this distribution over here, this binomial distribution, were not, um, did not have an, e an underlying equal chance of getting, you know, yes or no, then you would not see a peak at a peak at the middle, you would see a peak somewhere else, more appropriate to the fact that you now have a biased chance of getting, say, heads or tails. This one I just showed you represents flipping a coin a hundred times, a fair coin, but if your coin were weighted such that it more frequently came up heads, then you would see a different distribution. The chance of seeing heads or tails, the chance of rolling a particular number on a die, these are parameters of the distribution. So we're going to have to deal with some parameters. Now for a binomial distribution, there's one common parameter, either called pi or p, usually, or p, and this is the chance of, roll, of say, flipping and getting a heads. For a fair coin, this is one half, and that's the parameter of the model. For an unfair coin, you might have the probability of getting heads be three quarters, or maybe one quarter. Each of these values, of, the pi itself is a parameter of the distribution, and each of these values is a particular value of that parameter. The entire parameter space is a set of all values that the parameter can take. In this case, since the underlying parameter here is a probability of a single act, that must be between zero and one, so the, pro the parameter space is the line 0 and 1, inclusive. So that's a parameter space. There are common and less common um, parameters. The ones you'll see most often fall into two categories, location and scale. Location represents sort of where the center of the distribution is. The one you see most often is the mean of a distribution. Let's use an example, the normal distribution. This is a continuous, but the ideas hold more generally. So here is one distribution, which has a mean at zero. If I do the same thing, but I shift it to the right, and it's supposed to be the same thing, <laughs> shift it to the right to say 10, the distribution now has a different mean. I've changed the location of the distribution without changing any other property. Location of the distribution, the mean in this case, is a parameter of the distribution, often referred to as mu, the Greek letter mu. Um, the scale is another kind of parameter that represents more of the shape of the distribution. One thing you'll see very often is um, a standard deviation, often represented by sigma the Greek letter sigma. Now again, we can draw a normal distribution. This is a normal distribution with a relatively wide sigma. It's wider. If we were to shrink the value of sigma, we would get a more narrow distribution. The wider the distribution, the more spread out it is, the more variance we have in the distribution, the narrower it is, um, the less variance we have in the distribution, and the smaller, we're more likely to get values um, towards the mean in this one than we are in this one. Variance, by the way, is a different term that's related to standard deviation. The variance of, of these things is usually called sigma squared. Um, and this is just the square of the standard deviation, and it helps you understand exactly how spread out these individual distributions are around their means. Um, when you have a standard distribution, we set the mean equal to zero and the standard deviation equal to one. That's the standard mean, that's a standard distribution. 
It's used most frequently when you talk about the standard normal distribution, in which it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So these location and scale parameters, and there are other parameters, there are shape parameters and sort of other parameters um, that we'll talk a little more about later, um, are they related to the moments of distributions, which we'll talk about um, in the second to last module of this lecture. But all these things help you represent different underlying processes by changing the shape and location of the distribution that's supposed to represent the process. And you often come up with hypotheses that relate directly to the parameters of these distributions. Right? If your theory says that the mean of some distribution should be zero, but your data say the mean, is, mean of the distribution is actually 510, your theory probably has a problem. <laughs> And that's the, the variance is so wide that your data is actually worthless, right? So the comparisons of, of sample parameters to theoretical pro, um, population parameters, often called population parameters or population distributions, um, help you do statistical inference. And this is stuff you'll learn a whole bunch more of when you go into stats. Okay. So that's it for this module. Um, in the next one, we'll discuss um, a different kind of distribution, the cumulative distribution, which adds up pieces of the of the probably mass distribution. Thank you very much.